it is a hiram and i feel how quickly the day passed thank you very much for having me as a guest speaker i'm here to share the buddhist teachings with you with you this morning for everyone's happiness I truly appreciate the great opportunity given today. Let's put the hand together in the show. The ocean of the birth and death of a painful existence has no bound. Only by the sip of Amida's universal vow carries us unfailingly across the ocean of birth and death to reach the other shore. Namanda, Namanda. You find this hymns, um, it is called the Hymns of the Pure and, um, I love this um, hymn. Today we are observing the Higan service. Most of you already know Higan means the other shore, the shore of Buddha's land of enlightenment. You probably heard of that million times. The Buddha left us with many teachings. The essential teaching is life is suffering. Probably heard of this phrase, but what does it mean to us? How can we apply this teaching life is suffering to our everyday life? We live in this shore, the world of ups and downs, the world of sufferings. The teaching of the Buddha guides us to reach enlightenment from the world of ups and downs. The Buddha said, awakening to wisdom and compassion is a key to being enlightened. We often talk about the other shore compared to this shore, however, we seem not likely sure how we get there. In the world of our ups and downs, our emotions depend on our imagination or expectation. We are always on the emotional roller coaster. One day we may be happy, one day we may be disappointed. So expectation and emotion plays a significant role in our life. Buddhism teaches us to keep our emotions as neutral as possible. By doing so, our view change. When we have a different view, things become better or things become outstanding. It is excellent teaching and we apply it to our daily life. Let's think about it. The Buddha said, life is suffering, but on the other hand, the Buddha said, we are the one creating suffering, right? It is hard to imagine something if we haven't, haven't experienced the worst suffering. Let me share my suffering with you. My webcam stopped working 10 minutes before a meeting the other day. Actually, it happened today as well, <laughs> but as soon as I found it, it wasn't from the computer crash. Uh, so uh, it wasn't so bad. Then last week, my computer froze when I clicked the Zoom link five minutes before a meeting with Hasebe Sensei uh, to this morning. Uh, I, again, same thing happened. I feel so sorry. I thought probably uh, she was so worried. And I could not reboot the computer. Okay, things are getting worse, I thought. <laughs> but my computer wasn't completely dead. Hopefully, um, I can finish the Dharma talk today. <laughs> Two years ago, someone hit my car from the back while I was waiting at an intersection to make a left turn. My car had to be in the car shop for a while. 
but it could be worse again. Mm. I didn't get a severe injury, so I learned the Buddha's words. Life is suffering, nothing is permanent. In everyday life, I'm learning. I think the challenging thing is to keep our emotions neutral. If we can truly understand things without adding value or emotion, each moment is a fantastic moment of blessing. When we were students, our teachers always gave us quizzes or study materials before the actual test to prepare for it. However, in a real life situation, many surprising events unfold before us. There is no quiz or rehearsal, full of surprise we experience. Surprise means something unexpected. Then we add value to the unexpected event. Having a baby is a good thing and losing a loved one is terrible. We constantly add value to life events. The word surprise consists of two, two parts. The first part is sir and prize. Sir means above, over, beyond. And prize means to take or to grasp. So let's put two parts together. It means we are overtaken by something that we didn't see coming. Okay. To me, surprise is something that unfolds in front of me before, beyond my control without my expectation. And those things are for me to grasp. Sometimes I feel happy and sometimes I feel sad. As I grew old, it became a more positive meaning to me. I tend to take a surprising thing that I might enjoy, such as a surprise, birthday party, or a promotion to become a minister after two years of hospitalization. I think the present is the middle point of future outcomes based on our past behaviors. Someone told me the word surprise was formally spelled S-U-R-P-R-I-Z-E, not S-E. Yes, the latter part was a prize as the winner gets a prize. I want to mention that the surprise is closely related to the English word understand. By the way, Indian ancient language is in the same language family of English. So now let's look at an English word understand in the ancient Indian language Sanskrit. Okay, let's look at a dictionary. First of all, surprise is listed as a translation for the English uh, Indian word prajnya. And prajna means wisdom in English. And then prajna was translated as chie in Japanese and then also in Chinese, all meant wisdom. Prajna is wisdom that is higher than the knowledge obtained by reasoning or and uh, inference. In Buddhism, wisdom is a critical a practice. It is one of six practices called paramita or six perfections. It carries us to cross the sea of birth and death to the other shore, which is the land of bliss. Six paramita is like a fairy, and other shore symbolizes the world of enlightenment. The other shore is opposed to our everyday life with suffering. The Buddha showed the six parameter for bodhisattvas to get to the other shore of spiritual awakening. The tradition says, 
parameter is the pathway to attain Buddhahood. Six practices were conveyed as the Bodhisattva's practices. However, according to Shinran Shonin, although we, which means you and me, may try to follow these Bodhisattva practices, it is imperative to understand our selfish nature and innate self-centeredness. So um, uh, do you think we are hopeless? Here, I would like to share the story of India and Ashura from a Buddhist scripture. Asra, an evil god, the enemy of Indian gods, was originally a god of justice. However, because he fought against the king of heavens, Indra, he was banished from heaven and fell into the world of demons. An unfortunate incident triggered it. Asra had a beautiful daughter and he wanted his lovely girl to marry the king of gods, Indra. However, Indra never knew Asra's wish. So one day, Indra happened to see Asra's daughter and he fell in love with her and kidnapped her. Asra's daughter was surprised, but they became a loving couple and they lived happily ever. It is a story from the view of Indra. His father Asra, who was robbed of his daughter, got angry, could never forgive Indra's behavior. He resented, hated, and challenged Indra. Indra is the best in courage, so Asra's ability cannot be matched. But he continued to challenge, even if he was defeated many times. And Asra became a demon of obsession. What do you think about the story so far? This was started with Indra's violent behavior. So Indra should be blamed, not Ashura. However, the sutra portrayed their positions exactly the opposite. In the end, Indra became the guardian god of Buddhism because of his mighty fighting and Ashura became an evil god. How do you explain? Is it because he conflicted with mighty king Indra? At first, I was puzzled. I thought it was a wrong ending and this story must have missing parts. The story was not convincing me. A few years ago, I finally found the uh, uh, missing parts. I came across a scripture that described the continued battle between the King, uh, King Indra and Asra. Let me continue the story. At one time, the army, the army of Indra was really defeated. The army of Indra continued to lose after being chased by the army of Asra. Suddenly, Indra found a golden bird's nest in his way with chicks in it. If he let the chariot, his chariot go as it is, these chicks will be trumped under the wheels. So Indra ordered his entire army to stop and head toward Ashra. Ashra was the one surprised. Suddenly, Indra's army started running towards his army. Ashra thought Indra had tricks, and thus Ashra's army ran away. This story strongly emphasizes Indra's compassion for little lives. 
when we fight, we forget our compassion for weak and small beings. When the battle is justified, the human mind becomes unbalanced and insensitive. People tend to accept having one of two, few or hundred victims for justice. As fighting develops, people realize the number of victims increased to thousands. Indeed, justice was on Asura's side at first. Everybody understood his anger when his daughter was kidnapped. However, the moment he lost his mind with resentment, he became a prisoner of his anger. And then he lost a compassionate heart for all living things. Since then, he has decided, he has dedicated him to revenge. In the beginning, Asura was a god of justice, a happy father of a beautiful daughter, and Indra was a naughty wild god. Asura lost his rational mind because of his anger and he even lost his ability to think. Asura couldn't think he might have behaved poorly like Indra under the same situation. As you can see, Asura justified himself to fight driven by his anger and then lost all his compassion for others, he naturally made himself into an evil being. No one sent him to hell. He put himself in hell by his deeds. Let's look at King Indra. Indra misbehaved at the beginning. He was barbaric and kidnapped the daughter of Asra but later, Indra regained compassion in his heart. He restored the compassion for small and weaker living things. He regretted, repented, changed, gave in, and engaged in good deeds. These are the most vital factors in Buddhism to cross the other shore. Indra entrusted himself to the Buddha and protected the Buddha. Indra thus became the guardian god of Buddhism. His good deeds made him a guardian god. In this way, Asra eventually became the, the evil god and Indra became a guardian. At first glance, it looks like an upside down result from what we expect, expected or predicted. But even in our world, we often forget others when we believe justice is on our side. It was a precious Buddha's message. We better not leave the compassionate heart as a Buddhist at any time, even we are fighting for justice. And finally, I would like to talk about something important for us. Jodo Shinshu has an essential sutra called the Smora Sutra or Amida Sutra. At the beginning of this sutra, the sutra lists the listener's name, Buddha's disciples, devas, bodhisattvas, etc., etc. Asura's name is not mentioned at the beginning. However, the epilogue, the smaller sutra ends like this. 
Saliputra, along with the multitude of monks and all beings of the world, including devas, humans, and asras, having heard the Buddha's teaching, rejoicingly accepted it, bowed in worship, and then departed. As you just heard, the sutra mentioned Asra's name. He attended the gathering and listened to the Buddha's teaching. It suggests the Buddha also showed Asra the pure land. Even he made a fatal mistake. The Buddha's compassion embraces him. And Asra is in the Buddhist family. I cried when I first discovered it. I had so much sympathy for Ashra. I cried for Ashra since I wanted him to be liberated badly. I chanted and thanked, to the, thanked the Buddha for his compassion. On Ohigan service, I am glad to share the Buddha's wisdom and the compassion with you. We are all embraced, no matter what. Uh, uh, in, we are embraced and uh, the Buddha's compassion always embraces us. And then uh, I am Looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu.